a vote in the Senate. And you may remember that the Senate passed a resolution apologizing for that this summer. And the movement to do that was led by two Southern senators. Thank you very much, Patricia Bernstein. The book is called The First Waco Horror, The Lynching of Jesse Washington and the Rise of the NAACP. Thank you. Sundown towns use policemen, fire, bricks, and signs to force blacks out of the suburbs and into the ghettos. Some of them are still in existence today, according to sociology professor James Lowen. He chronicles their history in the new book, Sundown Towns. This is an hour, 10 minutes. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome James Lowen today to discuss his new book, which is called Sundown Towns. Uh, Dr. Lowen is also the author of the best-selling book, Lies My Teacher Told, Taught Me, uh, which is loved by teachers and students alike because it takes aim at the sanitized textbooks used to misrepresent history. His new book, Sundown Towns, is the result of years of research into the formation and the persistence of white-only towns. I've often wondered about towns with names like Whitesboro or White City. Uh, but the story of codified white supremacy in American towns and suburbs is long and harrowing and amazingly well hidden. This book is a remarkable contribution to the account of institutionalized racism in the United States. I'm glad to note that uh, the book is reviewed very favorably by Laura Wexler in today's Washington Post. Please welcome Dr. James Lowen. Thanks, Virginia. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, I want to say just a word about uh, independent bookstores in general, and this one in particular. Um, I've actually become an educated person by coming to all these free events here. And um, I want to uh, thank you all uh, at the bookstore for them. And I want to also say that I do make it my policy, usually, uh, I try to, when I come to a a free event like this uh, book talk to buy a book, not necessarily the book that's being sold that evening, but some book um, before leaving, because although it's a free event, the bookstore still needs to make money somehow, you know. Um, this evening, however, I would suggest that you would want to get my book. <laughs> you were supposed to laugh just when I said this evening, however. You're not as sharp as I was hoping, but anyway. Um, I also want to say something about uh, this book just to get started. Um, I actually think it's the most important book I've written. And I've written seven, maybe. I don't know. Maybe eight. Um, Lies My Teacher Told Me has done awfully well, and it keeps on selling. And I'm very happy I wrote it, and I think it's a very important book. But Lies My Teacher Told Me makes uh, people amazed who are not historians or haven't really studied it closely. Uh, it actually even amazes historians out of their period. But any historian who knows about, for instance, the Civil War and um, reads what I say about it in Lies My Teacher Told Me is not amazed, OK? But this book, Sundown Towns, is actually going to, I think, amaze everyone, sociologists and historians and so on. Because in it, I think I have discovered and, and published for the world a bunch of new stuff, stuff that's never been written by anybody before. And I think it's actually disgusting, as well as amazing, that it's never been written by anybody before. In fact, while I was doing the research for this book, which took me five, five years of doing almost nothing else, I kept expecting to find stuff about this subject, and, and I found virtually nothing at all, okay? So I want to take you all on a uh, journey of discovery because I have to persuade you of the magnitude of the phenomenon that Sundown Towns purports, and I think correctly purports, to have discovered, all right? And if I just tell it to you, I'm not sure you'll believe me because I didn't believe it. I had, you know, I had to find it. I had to uh, be convinced of it. So I want to take you on the same journey that I made. Um, in the process of taking that journey, we're going to answer the basic questions, which are, what are sundown towns? Where are they? How many are there? Um, when did they get created? Um, how did they get created? How do they get maintained? What difference do they make? Anyway, and finally, what should we do about them? Well, what is a sundown town? A sundown town is a community that for decades, and some of them still do it, kept out 
people of color, particularly Af African Americans. Now, some of them kept out, especially in the West, Chinese Americans or Japanese Americans. I discovered two towns in Nevada that sounded a whistle at 6 p.m. every night to tell Native Americans or American Indians they must be gone. Uh, I discovered one town in California and one in Colorado, and I'm sure I've missed probably dozens more, that kept out Mexican Americans. There are many, many, many suburbs, especially, and also some beach communities and some resort mountain communities that kept out Jewish Americans, okay? And all of those things are covered in sundown towns. But the great target was, and to some degree remains, African Americans, okay? Um, they get their title because many of these towns in the Midwest, in Oregon, in California, in the, across the North, except the Northeast and the East, um, put signs at their city limits, typically saying, quote, nigger, don't let the sun go down on you in Manitowoc, for instance, which is a town, a city actually of about 30,000 in Wisconsin on Lake Michigan, and which did have such signs. Or I might have said Ashland, Oregon, or Taft, California, or Pekin, Illinois, or Miaka City, Florida, all of which did have such signs, okay? Not all sundown towns had such signs, of course. Um, many of them did not. V almost no sundown suburbs had such signs. And I need to tell you that sundown, well, let's, get, let's skip ahead to uh, when did these towns come into being. They came into being between 1890 and 1940, for the most part. There's some seats in the middle here, and a couple over here. Um, they came into being between 1890 and 1940. They weren't always this way. Uh, one of the things I learned while doing the research for this book is that in America, between 1863 and 1890, African Americans went everywhere, all right? Um, they got into every county in Indiana but one every county in Montana but one, all over the place, okay? Chinese Americans did the same thing. This actually surprised me even more. I mean, I, of course I grew up and, and until recently kind of thought of Chinese Americans as creatures of the big city. They live in Chinatown in San Francisco, do they not? Chinatown in this city, Chinatown in Chicago, and so on. Well, yes, they do now. Uh, I thought this was just natural. Of course, when a sociologist says natural, he puts quotation marks around it, by which he really means deep in our culture so that I didn't think about it. All right? um, after all, they had left a big city. Most Chinese came here from Canton, China, uh, over 90%. That's a big city. They came on ocean-going vessels, of course, and they mostly came into a big city, San Francisco, the largest city in the West at the time. But no, that's not the case. They came into San Francisco, and they went all over the place. They were in every county in Wyoming. They were tw in, in 1890, or, well, excuse me, in 1870 and into the 1880s. They were in every county of Idaho. In fact, they were 20% of the population of Idaho, which is one of our most rural states then and now. Okay? But then, between about 1884 and 1900, the Chinese undergo a vast retreat, and it's kind of a prologue to what I'm gonna talk about happened to black folks. Uh, that is, they get pressured out of, in fact, they get driven out of every county in Wyoming except one. They get driven out of almost every county and community in Idaho. More than 50 towns in California drive out their Chinese. Even large cities like Tacoma, Washington, drive out their entire Chinese population, send them on two big boats back to San Francisco. So that's how Chinese ended up in Chinatown, okay? Well, I had the same misconception about African Americans. I grew up in Decatur, Illinois, which is a city of 60 to 90,000, depending on which census you look at, uh, in the center of Illinois. And it had a substantial black, black population, about 15, 20 percent. Um, I knew that. And I, it never occurred to me that all the little towns around Decatur, uh, Monticello, Niantic, uh, Dalton City, I'm sure these names mean a lot to you, um, I knew they were all white. It never occurred to me they were all white on purpose. I mean, I thought, I'd rather live in Decatur. It has motion picture theaters, you know, and, and grocery stores and things. And, um, and that's what black folks would rather do. Um, I'll tell you about how my mind got changed in, in just a few minutes. So between 1863, uh, when refugees from the Civil War and when thing, uh, slavery basically started ending everywhere the United States Army controlled, uh, between 1863 and 1890, black folks went everywhere. 
I mentioned they ended up in every county in Indiana but one, every county of uh, Montana but one, and so on. Then, beginning in 1890, from 1890 to 1940, commenced what historians call the nadir of race relations. And uh, nadir, of course, means low point, right? It's an English language word. We're not talking Ralph here. N-A-D-I-R, um, the opposite of zenith, I guess. The nadir of race relations is the period 1890 to 1940. Uh, I have a whole chapter on it in here in which I call it the nadir gestation, I don't know what I call it, something like the nadir gestation period for uh, sundown towns. What happened during the nadir was, in the South, uh, the real end of Reconstruction. Now, of course, Reconstruction formally ended in about 1876. But it, black folks were still voting in the South. Uh, there was still possibility for black-white coalitions. The, the Democratic Party had no lock on the South at that point. And of course, remember, the Democrats were the party of, of white supremacy in the 19th century um, and well into the 20th century, into the 1920s, called themselves the White Man's Party. This is hard to remember sometimes because exactly 41 years ago, the two parties flip-flopped on this matter. But in the 19th century, the Democrats were the party of white supremacy, and they ended Reconstruction by force and fraud in 1876, but they didn't really end uh, the voting of black folks. They didn't really end the possibility for interracial co cooperation in the South. That ended in 1890 with Mississippi's Constitution of 1890, which removed blacks from citizenship, took away the right, their right to vote, and the United States did nothing, even though it directly contravened the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. So every other southern state and states as far away as Oklahoma followed suit by 1907. Okay, that's one of the reasons we date the Nader exactly at 1890. There are a couple of others, but uh, I won't go into them right now. But what I've learned doing this research is that the period of Reconstruction, while it only applied legally to the South, it applied ideologically to the whole country. Uh, that, and, and actually nobody's written about that either, or hardly anybody. Um, in the North, especially in Republican communities, or communities with considerable numbers of Quakers, or Unitarians, or Presbyterians, or uh, United Church of Christ, or Congregationalists, or Methodists, and these are a lot of communities, you know, uh, these towns actually, many of them developed a welcoming attitude towards black folks. Let me give you just one example. Uh, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Even during the Civil War, I think it was in late 1863 or early 64, a train comes to Fond du Lac bearing one or two cars, passenger cars, full of black folks, along with a white chaplain from the United States Army who had uh, been assigned to Carroll, Illinois, which is down at the bottom of Illinois, where the, which was kind of a staging ground for the Civil War in the Mississippi Valley, and a bunch of refugees, uh, black refugees and white refugees for that matter, and wound up in Carroll. So he helped this carload or so get to Fond du Lac. And it was the biggest event in town. Everybody comes down to see these folks. There hadn't been very many black folks in Wisconsin at that point. And folks sign up for them. I could use a hand. I'm putting in a new orchard. I could use two, you know, and so on. Before they got parceled out to folks, they all got uh, supper and spent the night in the uh, local hotel downtown. And then the next day they, they went off and, and commenced living in Fond du Lac, okay? And so it was kind of, I, I think it was kind of like, and not just in Fond du Lac, the phenomenon that we saw in the 1960s and early 1970s when colleges actually across the North and the South uh, started competing for uh, African Americans. I mean, my college, for instance, Carleton College, I actually went to college with the fifth black person ever to graduate from Carleton College. And Carleton had been in existence 102 years when I graduated, so that you can do the math. That's one every 21 years or so, okay? Um, but I graduated in 1964. Right at that point, Carleton and Yale and University of Maryland, for that matter, started competing in the late 60s for African Americans and, and certainly opening up their gates to them. And I think uh, many, many towns, especially Republican towns, opened up to black folks across the North. But then in the 1890s, 1890 to 1940, this nadir, this reaction, this terrible period sets in. Uh, another reason we dated to 1890 is because in 1890, the United States Senate failed to pass by a single vote the Fair Elections Bill. Now this bill is kind of similar to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Not as good, but not a bad bill. It would have helped publicize the fact that 
blacks were increasingly finding it difficult to vote fairly and freely in the South. It would have penalized the South for in interfering with uh, black right or anybody's right to vote, and so on. And it passed the House, and it failed by a single vote in the Senate. Of course, President Benjamin Harrison, the Republican president, would have signed it into law. Well, after defeating this bill, the Democrats did their usual trick, which was to tar the Republicans, to accuse them of being, quote, black Republicans, unquote, of being nothing but a bunch of, quote, nigger lovers, unquote. The Republicans had faced this before. What they had done up until then was to say, you're darn right, somebody ought to be standing up for these folks. It's an outrage what you people are doing down the South on Election Day, and this needs to stop. But they made a new response after 1890. Their new response was, no, we aren't. And you remember what the charge was? No, we aren't. So at that point, the Republicans gave up on civil rights for everybody. And that's another reason then that we, and the Democrats had never had any use for it at all. So now there was no political or, or any remedy for the, the bereft quality of African Americans and African American civil rights in America. Well, across the United States then between 1890 and 1940, as I discovered in doing the research for sundown towns, community after community drove out its black population. And I've uncovered scores of little race riots. Uh, we know, we've always known of a few of the big ones, like I think it was 1917 East St. Louis, 1919 Chicago, 1919 Washington, D.C. Uh, only recently has the memory of the one in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I think 1921, been recovered. Uh, we know of that one now. But I'm talking about scores more. The race riot in Pinckneyville, Illinois, for instance, which I haven't even dated for sure, but I think was 1928, in which the black community was expelled, never to return. And it's an eerie sense that you have. I've, I've been in the community in Pinckneyville called the Black Hills. Now, I got to tell you, it's not called the Black Hills because it looks like South Dakota. Okay, it is hilly, mildly hilly. I mean, we're talking Illinois after all. Um, it's called the Black Hills because this was the black community. Since 1928, it has been all white, okay? And in sundown towns, there's a portfolio of pictures in here, which I recommend to you, um, those of you with the book, turn to the, no, it's all right. Um, I recommend the pictures because they will help take you through this process of discovery about this topic that otherwise is, I hope, new to you because it was certainly new to me. Now, if you've known this all along, come up and tell me during this book signing, and I'll, I'll learn from you some of the things you know. Um, but in the portfolio of pictures, for instance, there's a photo of the black school in Pinckneyville, which since 1928 has been a white house. Okay? Now, I don't know if the black residents of Pinckneyville got paid for these houses. I do know they did not get paid market value because, of course, they fled in a night of terror and it's real hard to negotiate a fair price under that condition, okay? And in many towns, for instance, Pierce City, Missouri, which had its riot a little earlier, 1901 or 1902, and there's a picture here of one of the houses in, Pierce City had over 300 black folks, 10% of the population. Drove them out in a fiery night, uh, burned some of the houses. The other houses just got taken and got uh, lived in by white folks. Blacks didn't get a dime for this. This is just like what happened in Nazi Germany in 1937-38, okay? And this happened in town after town. Most recently, and I think this is just amazing, most recently in 1954 in Vienna, Illinois, when the black community was torched out, never to return, uh, and nothing uh, was done about it. Well, I first learned of these, the first of these towns that I learned about while I was an undergraduate. Uh, maybe I mentioned I went to Carleton College in southern Minnesota. Um, Carleton back then had a bunch of people, it has fewer now, but had a bunch of people from Minnesota going to it, you know, and many of those were from the suburbs of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And some of them were from the richest single suburb and most prestigious single suburb, which was, and still is, Edina. And the folks from Edina said, some of them with pleasure, some of them were chagrin, that Edina was known far and wide for having, quote, not one Negro and not one Jew. And it didn't either. Uh, just for the record, since then it, it now does. It has one of each. Um, no, it has a bunch, but it, then it had one, uh, none. And I thought that was outrageous, actually. Uh, and then I learned a little later of the notorious Darien, Connecticut, which is one of the richest and most prestigious suburbs of New York City. And 
Darien was briefly famous for this practice. In 1948, the Academy Award winning Best Picture went to Gentleman's Agreement, uh, which, um, I'm trying to remember the star. Gregory Peck, thank you. Um, which is a movie about the fact that realtors and the power structure in general in Darien, Connecticut, had a gentleman's agreement to keep out Jews and, of course, keep out African Americans. Incidentally, the movie didn't do any good locally. That is to say, Darien maintained the policy for several more decades after 1948. Um, but still, um, it became kind of locally famous that you're supposed to be an Aryan if you live in Darien. Um, I thought that was outrageous. And then I learned of Anna, Illinois. Um, Anna is a town down by Carroll, 30 miles north of Carroll. Um, and I learned that in 1909, Carroll had a um, spectacle lynching. You know, lynchings became spectacle lynchings around 1900. Some of them did. And this was one of those. By this, I mean it was announced ahead of time. So it's a long story how this lynching happened and what the sheriff was doing and so on. It's all told in, in some downtowns. Um, it was perhaps the first brilliantly illuminated nighttime lynching in the United States. There's a photo of it in the book, uh, a double uh, overhead um, arch of, of bright lights. Uh, Carol was very proud of this, illuminated Carol's downtown major intersection. And this is where they had this nighttime lynching. Thousands of people came, and they're all in the photo. The, the Illinois Central ran excursion trains to make a buck to Carol to come see this famous event. And a bunch of people came from uh, Anna, Illinois, 30 miles to the north, partly because the woman who had been murdered, uh, allegedly by the black man who was about to be lynched, hailed from Anna originally, and ironically was named Anna. Well, after she uh, was killed and after he, the alleged assailant, was hung in, the, in downtown Cairo, the folks from Anna went home and thought that was such a good idea that they drove out their black population. Uh, and from that day to this, Anna has been known as, quote, ain't no niggers allowed, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, unquote. And again, I, I just thought that was outrageous. And so I vowed finally to, to write a book about it. And I'm actually sorry that I didn't write it uh, years ago, but, but I've written it now. Well, where are these towns? Person after person has told me when I said, well, I'm writing, you know, they said, what are you doing now? You know, you've got lies my teacher told, told me is done and, and lies across America. And I said, well, I'm working on this book on sundown towns, towns that kept out black folks. And they said, oh, yeah, down in Mississippi, right? Alabama. No, uh, the traditional South didn't do this. Um, this is a phenomenon across the North, but generally not in the traditional South. Now, it is in the, what we might call the non-traditional South, like the Ozarks, if you consider that South, or Appalachia, uh, far western North Carolina, far east Tennessee, for instance, uh, far west Maryland. Um, but Mississippi, for instance, I lived in Mississippi for seven or eight years, so I did an exhaustive search of sundown towns in Mississippi. I believe I located six, okay? How many have I found in the rest of the country? Well, I grew up in Illinois, so I decided I would do more research in Illinois than any other single place, single state, partly because if somebody said, well, I, I've heard that Kenilworth is, is some downtown, well, I knew that was a suburb of Chicago, or if somebody says, I've heard that Villa Grove had um, a siren, which we'll get to Villa Grove siren in a minute, um, I, I would uh, know that that was kind of in eastern Illinois. I expected to find 10 sundown towns in Illinois, and maybe 50 across the rest of the country. I found 472 sundown towns in Illinois alone, which translates to probably 10,000 across the United States, okay? This is a majority of all incorporated communities in Illinois, all right? Now, this is astounding, and, and I wouldn't blame you if you, if you don't believe me. Uh, in fact, I want to recount a, a brief conversation I had with um, some folks in Wisconsin about this. Uh, I asked these folks, one guy in particular, who's a fine scholar, expert on, uh, he's a historian, he works at the Wisconsin State Historical Society, he's the expert in the U.S. on the black press, 
on, on uh, African American newspapers across the country. I asked him if he knew of any sundown towns in Wisconsin, and he replied by email something like this. No, you may find a few of these communities in Illinois, but I, my, I've asked several of my colleagues here at the Wisconsin State Historical Society, and we don't believe there are any in Wisconsin. Okay? Well, I believe that there are at least 200 in Wisconsin, and I have uh, found and proven at least 10, okay? Um, now, you might say 10 out of 200. That's not very good, is it? Well, no, I didn't do that much research in Wisconsin on the ground. Um, I think that they, that they will prove to be so. Um, but my correspondent, when I brought to him that I had 10, including large cities, major towns, like I already mentioned, Manitowoc, um, Appleton, Appleton, Wisconsin is a city of 50,000 to 70,000 people, depending on which census you look at. And everybody in Appleton knew it to be a sundown town as recently as the early 1970s. This is where Lawrence University is. This is where uh, a certain man named Joe McCarthy comes from. Um, he was amazed. Folks in Wisconsin were amazed. Okay. So how can I convince you that this actually happened? Well, I want to tell you the moment that I really, it was kind of an aha moment um, when I realized that I had been misthinking this. See, I had been putting all white communities into three categories. First, your sundown towns, like Anna. Second, your sundown suburbs. I need to tell you, they're a little, in, a little later. If sundown towns are 1890 to 1940, that's when they were created. Sundown suburbs are about 1905 or so to 1968. Um, some of them even later, but they mostly still, still being created as of, of 1968. But the largest category, I thought, would be all white towns that are all white by accident. That is, towns that no black folks ever went to, like these little towns around Decatur. I thought, why do black folks have to go to every dumb little town that I didn't want to live in anyway, you know? Okay, all white by accident. So that was my residual category. I still always put a community there. It's a community of interest to me, but I, I put it there until proven otherwise, right? Then one evening... I remember it vividly, it was October 2001, I was speaking at my hometown, the Decatur Public Library. Uh, I was the keynote speaker at the second annual Decatur Writers Conference. This is because I'm the third best-selling author from Decatur. Uh, for the first annual one, they had had the best-selling author. For the second annual one, they had me, the third best-selling author. I asked them, how come they didn't have the second best-selling author, who is, or who was, Stephen Ambrose, the famous historian. He was then alive, and furthermore, it was before his plagiarism scandal. And, um, and they said, well, that's a good question. He said, because he charges $40,000 plus a private jet both ways. And I said, gee, I saved you over $38,000. And they said, yes, yes, you did. Uh, so I was speaking at the second annual uh, Decatur Writers Conference, and I gave my talk about lies my teacher told me. I was going to wave it, but it seems to have moved away. Um, and after I got done, I said, well, now I'm doing this research on sundown towns. And I told them what a sundown town was. And I asked them uh, to come on down if they knew anything about it. To my amazement, 20 people came down. And I had my little yellow pad. I need to say I've got my yellow paper here, and I'm going to have it at my book signing. And if any of you know about some sundown towns that I may have missed, Please tell me, and I'll write down your email and what you know and so on. We'll get, we'll get some more information, because I want to out every one of them. Uh, but anyway, they all came down, these 20 people, and they told me that town after town around Decatur, that they understood the following about it. For instance, Niantic, a little town of 900, just northwest of Decatur, even touches Decatur on its northwest corner. Not exactly a suburb, it was an independent town. Two different people told me that they understood that Niantic had an ordinance that said black folks could not spend the night, and that as a result of this ordinance, the Wabash Railroad, you've heard of the Wabash Cannonball, it went past my house, it actually was a train and it went through Decatur, uh, and the biggest yard of the Wabash is in Decatur, it's such a big yard it spills into Niantic, and they told me that the Wabash Railroad every night had to move its work train from the Niantic part of the yard to the Decatur part of the yard to avoid offending this ordinance because, you know, people sleep on the work train and some of them are African American and so they had to move this train. Well, I confirmed later with two different old ex-employees of the Wabash that was indeed the case. Two different people told me that um, Villa Grove, Illinois, which is a town over by Champaign-Urbana where the University of Illinois is, that Villa Grove blew a whistle every night at 6 p.m to tell blacks to be out of town. Now, I thought this was preposterous. 
I didn't know if you could have an urban legend in a town of 2,500, but I thought it was an urban legend. Okay, now it was telling me two things, was it not? Number one, Villa Grove has a whistle, and number two, Villa Grove was probably a sundown town, or at least these two people thought it was and had heard that it was. But the idea that it blew a whistle at 6 p.m., I mean, Villa Grove is not on the way to anywhere, and, and you know, I'm thinking, are there a whole bunch of African Americans at the edge of town at 559, only to be downcast once again because this damn whistle goes off, you know? Why not have a whistle to keep the elephants out, you know? I thought it was preposterous. So then, but, but you know, I wrote it down, and about a year later, I made a point to visit uh, Villa Grove. And in fact, I visited Villa Grove uh, in the late afternoon on a Saturday, 4.30 p.m. I went to the Shangri-La Hotel. And I recommend the next time you find yourself in Villa Grove in the evening that you stay at the other one. Um, <laughs> the Shangri-La is mostly an SRO, single room occupancy, for old white men. And I thought I would go interview some of these old white men because they know stuff, you know. They know not just about their, their past in Villa Grove. Some of them might be from other towns and they could tell me all kinds of stuff. Um, you have to do this research through oral history. Stuff isn't written down generally. There are exceptions, but generally it's not written down. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. On my way up the stairs to the Shangri-La, I was accosted, <laughs> rightly enough, by the weekend manager who was sitting on the porch. And he said, can I help you? And I want to recount for you this conversation verbatim. I think I have it memorized. I certainly wrote it down right afterwards. I said, sure. And I said something like, uh, my name's Jim Lowen, which just for the record it is, and I'm from Decatur over here, you know, I legitimized myself by talking about where I'm from and everything, and I said, now, is it true that Villa Grove has or, or had until recently, because my informants weren't sure if it, if it still sounded, uh, but if Villa, Villa Grove has or had until recently a siren, a whistle that sounds at 6 p.m., and he says, yes. I said, well, is it on a factory or a grain elevator? See, I figured it was probably a shift change at a factory. Um, he said, oh no, it's on the water tower. City property, isn't it? Uh, so then I said, um, well, why did it, uh, I said, does it still sound? He said, no, uh, it stopped about three years ago. I had this conversation in October of 2002, so this would have been 1999 when it stopped. I said, well, what did it sound for? Why did it go off? And he said, quote, well, do um, you mean um, originally? And I said, yes, originally. And he said, well, um, originally. Um, and I said to myself, my God, it's true. And so I said to him four words, no content. I didn't want to influence what he was going to say, but I said these four words. It's OK. I know. All right? And he looked relieved, and he said, well, originally it sounded to tell black folks to be out of town. And I was so this isn't good interviewing. I, I pride myself as being a good interviewer, but I was so surprised, even though I was understanding it happening, I said to him, really? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, well, why did they stop it? Was it because Villa Grove changed its policy? And he didn't know whether Villa Grove had changed its policy or not, but he said, no, they, it, it got stopped because people who live near the water tower got tired of the noise. Okay? <laughs> now, to be sure, for many people in Villa Grove, over the years, it became the 6 o'clock whistle, right? Now, Junior, you better be home at 6 o'clock for supper when you hear that whistle go off. There's no doubt that's the main meaning of it. But I asked him, I said, do you mean to tell me that people as late as 1998, 99, were still learning the original meaning of the whistle? And he said, oh, yes. Okay. He proceeded to tell me all kinds of other things about which mayor's administration it still sounded through, when it stopped sounding, and so on. I spent next Monday, I went back to Villa Grove on Monday, and I spent most of Monday um, interviewing other people. Everything he told me proved to be true. I confirmed it with at least seven other people. All right? I'm going to close this talk with my final interview in Villa Grove, um, but we'll, we'll come back. I'm not ready to close quite yet. Okay. Um, so I became aware that this null category, this, this category of um, towns that were all white by accident, was vanishingly small. That almost every town that was all white for census after census was all white on purpose. Even if it was in the upper peninsula of Michigan, even if it was in Idaho, and for sure if it was in Illinois or Maryland or whatever. 
And not just because of that one evening, but, but that was the, the line of thinking I went through. Um, what else do I need to tell you? How was this maintained? Well, by all manner, uh, basically, of white malbehavior, bad behavior by white folks, okay? I already mentioned the riots by which these all-white towns were created. Uh, many other towns, uh, like Villa Grove, well, Villa Grove may have driven out its black population, I don't know, but um, if it didn't ever have one, then it probably, and it, Villa Grove has a strong oral tradition of having passed an ordinance, okay? And in a sense, it has a visible representation of an ordinance. It's hard to show you an, or, an ordinance visibly, but I show this whistle, because uh, it's still on the water tower, so I took a picture of it and put it in the book. It's a vis visible manifestation of the ordinance, because it was put up by the county, uh, by the community, excuse me, to uh, symbolize the, and to sound off the, the policy. Since then, I found seven towns in all that had a 6 p.m. whistle, and six of them was for this reason, including these two in Nevada that I mentioned earlier that the whistle was to keep out Native Americans. Other towns are in Michigan and Ohio and, and other places in the United States. Often it was maintained in suburbs by government policies, like zoning, used in various ways. I described this. Um, What's it called? Uh, uh, exclusionary um, parts of your parts of your deed um, covenants. covenants. Thank you, uh, racial covenants, and I've been collecting them across the United States. Uh, that was used in many suburbs. Many suburbs, in fact, required um, racial covenants before allowing a subdivision or a developer to to submit a, an area for inclusion in the city. So, if a if an entire city gets covered by exclusionary covenants, then it gets on my radar screen. I'm not interested in communities that merely keep out blacks from bunches of neighborhoods. I'm only interested in towns that exclude blacks or others totally. Uh, and I assert that there's at least 10,000 such communities in the United States. Um, I want to give you an example of other ways it's maintained, it being this all-white nature of communities. Uh, this is just one typical ex example, it's actually less violent than most, um, but it's so well written. Uh, and this was written to me in an email a couple of years ago, but the original event happened in 1978 in Arcola. Arcola is another small town in Illinois, near, also near Champaign-Urbana. And then in 1978, my correspondent was in seventh grade, okay? And she had learned, you know, everybody knows everything in small towns. She had learned that there was a new family moving in that had two small kids. This news excited me. New babysitting opportunities. Remember, she's in seventh grade, okay? Um, later in the week, I was in the school office. This is the K-12 school. And when I saw a black woman at the secretary's desk, she looked angry. I overheard that her children could not get registered for school until all their records got transferred. I also heard, overheard lots of conversation regarding not knowing what happened to the records and blaming the males, etc. It didn't dawn on me what was happening. It didn't dawn on me either in reading this. I hope you're half to, faster than I am. It didn't dawn on me what was happening until a few days later, after school, at my grandfather's shop. Her grandfather ran the auto body shop in town, which was located across the side alley from the Byright grocery store. That's the main supermarket in Arcola. The same woman I had seen in the office at school pulled up to the Byright and got out of her car with her two kids. She went to the front door, and there was a closed sign on it, and the doors were locked. She looked around, as I did, because the parking lot was full. People inside looked to be shopping. I met her gaze, and in a brief instant, I had an epiphany. The light bulb was so bright, I thought I was blinded. I was so angry. I took her across the alley, and she met my grandpa. They talked in hushed tones, while I played with the kids. I overheard them talking about where she could get some things. He offered her gas. See, there's an issue, who's gonna sell her gas? Uh, but he had a above ground, his own above ground tank, since he was a auto body shop. And he gave her the names and locations of some Amish friends of his in the rural that could supply her with milk, eggs, meat, etc. They were there one day, and then a couple of weeks later they were gone. I don't blame them for leaving in the middle of the night. Business slowed at my grandfather's shop for a while just because she did that and he did that, okay? But it picked back up with the time. He picked back up with time. He was the only auto body shop in town, okay? Why haven't I heard of this before? Why haven't you heard of this before? 
Well, first of all, it is the first book on the topic. I think that's astounding. Uh, I want to compare it just for a minute with lynchings. Okay? Uh, I would assert that there, are, in the, there have been in the history of the United States about 10,000 lynchings. How do I get that number? Well, the main lynching database has in it about 4,600 lynchings, but it misses a lot of them. All right? So I think it misses about half of them. I mean, there's something like 10,000 then. I'm just saying something like. And there's something like 10,000 sundown towns. Okay? There have been more than 500 books written on lynchings, either on a specific lynching or on the phenomenon as a whole. There are several hundred in the Library of Congress. There are several hundred for sale right now in huge listings like Amazon.com, which will otherwise go unmentioned here. Um, more than 500 books on lynchings, and this is the first book on sundown towns. Why is that? I think there's a reason for that, and I think the reason in part is success. That is, we've stopped lynching, have we not? Now, you might argue, well, what about that dragging death in Jasper, Texas, for instance? Well, what about it? That was no lynching. A lynching, you know, is a public murder. That's the defining characteristic of it, done with substantial support from the community. This lynching, in, this murder in Jasper, Texas, you know, when those three white folks dragged this guy behind their pickup truck, this was a private matter done on a minor road late at night. And as soon as the community as a whole found out about it, they brought the three people to justice. They executed two of them and gave one of them life in prison. This is not exactly with support of the community. All right? Jasper stepped up to the plate, did what it should have done. Lynchings have basically ended in America. Sure, we have all kinds of uh, hate crimes, and, including hate murders, but we do not have lynchings. In that sense, it's a success story. I came to this conclusion, and so we can talk about it. It's a success story. I came to this conclusion when I was writing and thinking later about lies my teacher told me. Because I note, for instance, that textbooks written in America in the 1960s and 70s did a terrible job handling the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. But now they do a much better job. Why? Because during the George H.W. Bush administration, remember that one? We actually apologized for the incarceration, gave each survivor $20,000 in indemnity, said we're sorry. In that sense, it's a success story. I mean, we did the right thing. It took us a long time, etc. But now we can talk about it freely. Some downtowns we still have. Many, many communities, many rich sub white suburbs, uh, and many independent towns are still sundown as we speak. Okay? So it's not a success story. So it's harder to face. Um, what difference does it make? Well, I want to just suggest a couple of differences. Number one, white folks growing up in sundown towns are likely to grow up more racist. Maybe this is obvious to you, it certainly is to me. Uh, not all of them. There are some wonderful success stories. The most famous college basketball coach probably is John Wooden, for instance, at UCLA. And he seemed to do done fine with black folks like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know. And he grew up in a horrendous sundown town, uh, Martinsville, Indiana. He got over it, all right? It's possible. But it's not so easy. Because one of the things a, a sundown town or a sundown suburb is telling you as you grow up is... We're all white on purpose, and we think this is a good place to grow up, and this is good for you. Well, why would that be? That, there's only one corollary possible, right? Black folks are bad for you. They're an evil people. We have to be separate from them. You have to climb over that, and it's not so easy. So it's bad for white folks to grow up in sundown towns. Uh, I suggest it's not good for anybody, and it's bad for black folks to know that there are sundown towns. Not that we should hide the fact. We should get rid of them. All right? Um, it's also hard on the, on the, the city as a system. Um, it, around here, for instance, it's hard for a community like Brentwood. Now, Brentwood, Maryland, was a sundown town until about 1971. So was Mount Rainier. So was University Park, for instance. It's hard for towns like Brentwood and Mount Rainier to become and remain stable and interracial. Now, both of these communities are about 50-50 black, white right now, and increasingly Latino and so on, and they are stable and interracial, but it's tough. Why? Because White folks who gain more money and more money and more money, and we all want to do that, right, and more status, tend to want to move to more prestigious suburbs. It's a way of expressing your money. So they maybe want to move to uh, Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase is four different suburbs, all of which were sundown towns, all of which were created to be specifically all white, and which are pretty much sundown towns as we speak. In, in the year 2000, all four communities together had, I think, 17 or maybe 19 uh, uh, black, well, 
19 adults in families that had at least one black adult. Okay? They didn't have 19 black adults, but they had somewhere between maybe 8 and 19 black adults in all of these communities combined. You see what I mean? It's hard because, so in, in Illinois, for instance, it's hard for Oak Park, which is famously integrated. It was a sundown town until about 1950, but now it's integrated and famously integrated. But it's hard to keep integrated because the white folks in Oak, in Oak Park and elsewhere in the Chicago uh, metropolitan community, as they get richer, they want to move to the really best community, and that's maybe Kenilworth. And Kenilworth was created as a town that explicitly kept out Jews and blacks. And Kenilworth, in the year 2000, didn't have one single black family. Okay. So it's not a good thing for the social system either. So what should we do about it? Well, I would suggest, first of all, we should be outraged. All right? And second of all, there's some things that the last chapter is a bunch of remedies. I think there's things you can do individually, uh, if you're black, white, or other. And I submit most of you in this room are one of those three. Um, there's things you can do individually. And, and I suggest some of them in the book. Um, I'll suggest one here. We can all work for our state governments or the, the federal government, uh, even in its current state of indifference to racial issues. Uh, we can work for it to pass a Residence Rights Act. And I describe what that is in the book. It's kind of modeled after the Voting Rights Act. Real quickly, if a community has a sundown history, and this is provable, and I think I've proven it for a bunch of them, and you can prove it for others. If a community has a sundown history, second, if it still has sundown geography, like Chevy Chase does, or like Kenilworth does, or like Anna, Illinois does, uh, or Villa Grove, uh, and, it's, and then it has one third characteristic, namely, there's been at least two complaints in the last couple of years from black folks who have tried to buy a house in the or rent a house in the community and been rebuffed or had a difficult time, and then the Residence Rights Act would kick in. And one of its provisions would be um, houses in that community, families in that community, would lose their exemption on their income tax for mortgage interest. Now, of course, one of the best reasons to buy a house is because most of your house payments in the early years, you know, are mortgage interest, and you get to take that off your income tax. Uh, you can't take rent off, but you can take off interest. Well, as soon as, and th there's a reason for this, besides, the, there's a legitimate reason for this, and that is the United States, and for that matter, states, because they follow the same rule, uh, want to encourage home ownership, and I think that's good. But do we want to encourage home ownership by whites in all white sundown towns? Surely not. So let's remove that exemption. As soon as we do, every single homeowner in the community is going to want it, the community, to recruit black folks. Please, let's integrate, you know, so we can get back our exemption. This is one of the few uh, civil rights acts that's not only free, it's actually revenue enhancing. <laughs> okay? Well, there's other ideas about what to do as a, as a uh, remedy. I want to conclude by asserting that one of the reasons neither you nor I have heard about this until recently is because the, the story has been suppressed. And I just want to give you two quick examples. Um, I mentioned to you, Anna, um, the, the lead review in the Washington Post this morning is about my book and it leads off with this conversation I had, and my book leads off with the conversation I had in Anna in 2002, I think it was. Well, I confirmed Anna as a sundown town in the first 10 seconds I was there. I stop at a convenience store for coffee. I asked the clerk, is it true that Anna stands for A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, ain't no niggers allowed? And she says, yes, that's a shame, isn't it? And the rest of the conversation, uh, I repeat in, in the beginning, first page of the book. Okay, everybody knows this about Anna. So in 1954, Anna published a 450-page history of itself called, of course, Anna, Illinois, A Century of Progress. Okay, 1954. That's an interesting year for race relations, isn't it? Do you think that, th that this book is so fat and so full that it has a paragraph or two about every single business in town? There's a paragraph about the local Dairy Queen. Do you think there's one word about the dr expulsion of blacks in 1909? One word about the lynching? One word about the policy? One word about what ANNA stands for? Nothing. So you have to do this research by oral history. It's suppressed on the whole from the written record. And even orally, you can have problems. And so I want to close with this story from Villa Grove. I had spent the next Monday in Villa Grove, Illinois, 
talking with all kinds of folks, every one of whom confirmed it was a sundown town, and seven of whom confirmed the story about the whistle and its original purpose. The last interview of the day, I dropped in at the uh, weekly newspaper, a classic office, a classic newspaper right out of 1890. That is, it's a long storefront, kind of like, kind of like this bookstore, uh, longer and skinnier, and there's a counter in the front, and then there's the editor's desk, and there's the secretary over here, and there's some more stuff in the middle, and then at the back there's the printing press. It's all right there. Okay? And I stepped up to the counter and I introduced myself to the editor. I said, hi, I'm Jim Lowen. I'm from over here in Decatur, blah, blah, blah. And I'm writing this book about all white towns that are all white on purpose, such as this one. Now, normally I didn't do that. Normally I would try to extract from him confirmation. I'd already confirmed with 11 different people that Villa Grove was a sundown town, so I didn't need to do that. It was 4.30. I wanted to go back to the University of Illinois where I was spending the evening as a guest lecturer. He nodded and said yes. He said, I then said, quote, um, I understand you have or, or had until recently a whistle uh, on your water tower that sounded at 6 p.m. And he said, yes. And I said, tell me the story about that whistle. And he said, quote, I don't know any story about that whistle, unquote. Well, I had met one man previously that day who didn't know the story about that whistle, so I thought that was possible. I didn't think it was very likely, you know, the editor of the newspaper. But what am I going to do, shake him and say, yes, you do? You know? uh, so I said, well, okay, well, thank you very much. And at this point, the secretary sitting right over here piped up, and she said, you mean the story that that whistle sounded at 6 p.m. to tell African Americans to be out of town? And I said, yes, that story. And she said, I never heard that story. <laughs> you figure it out. That's the phenomenon of my book. And, and the reason I think it's so important is I think I want you to buy it, and I want you to read it, and keep it nice. And I'll just sign it blank. I'll sign it to you if you want, but I just soon sign it blank. And you keep it nice, and then you give it to somebody who needs it. Okay? Somebody who lives in one of these communities or somebody who will do something about it, or hopefully you will, and then you pass it on to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Because this is a, an ongoing shame in our nation. It's still going on right now across the North. We've got we've to know about it. The first way to change it is to out it. Because these communities want to be exclusive, but they don't want to be seen as excluding, because that's kind of lower class, right? So we need to out them and change them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Now, I'd love to take a couple of questions, maybe even more than a couple, but you have to use the microphone so that your question goes out to the ether. Um, there was a study did by, uh, by HUD a couple of years ago, and it concluded that Freddie May and Freddie Mac had engaged in uh, racial discrimination in their policy for lending. I think it was 40% uh, under the norm for blacks, something like 15% for Hispanics, and 33% over the norm for Asians. And then in, in 1934, the Federal Housing Authority that insures loans, at one time it was characterized as instituting policy that may have been curled from the Nuremberg. Right? To what extent does these lending institutions and this sure. Federal Housing Association exacerbate, you know, these kind of uh, closed communities? Good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's shocking to realize that actually having sundown towns has been illegal since 1917. Uh, in fact, in a sense, it was always illegal if you read the 14th Amendment, you know, uh, which guarantees black folks right to make contract without regard to race, for instance, and that includes the right to make housing contracts. But um, been, there was a Supreme Court decision right in the middle of the Nader period, this terrible period. There was nevertheless one positive Supreme Court decision about race, I think the only one, and it's called Buchanan v. Worley, and it came out in 1917. And what it said, it was against these uh, ordinances called uh, residential segregation ordinances, which had been passed, it, it was the thing to do, and they were passed by um, major southern cities and even non-southern cities as far north as Baltimore and Louisville and St. Louis, and New Orleans and so on. And what these ordinances said was, okay, if we have a white block or a majority white block, nobody black can buy a house on that block. 
we won't move out the black folks that already happen to be living on it if it's a majority white block. But nobody knew who's black can buy a house on that block. And same thing if we have a black block, nobody white can buy a house on that block. Okay? So it's even-handed, right? Like Plessy versus Ferguson. Well, of course, it was only enforced against blacks who wanted to move into white blocks. Um, it would immediately or fairly soon turn every city into complete apartheid, if you think about it, because fairly soon almost every house gets sold. You know, some houses stay in the family for generations, but most houses, people move, people die, and so on, they get sold. Um, why was this decision made in 1917? Well, it turns out the Supreme Court found that a white right was being violated. I don't think it would have done anything if a black right, a mere black right, had been violated in 1917 in the middle of the nadir. But a white right was violated. How so? Well, let's suppose you own a house that's worth $100,000. Of course, back then it would be a lot less, but let's say in today's market. Well, in today's market in D.C., it'd be 600000 But anyway, let's say you own a house that's $100,000, okay, in the white neighborhood, okay, and you want to sell it. And you get an offer of $100,000 from a white person, naturally. But some black person who wants to escape the ghetto or who wants to live on this block or for whatever reason wants to buy this house and is willing to pay you $110,000. But you can't sell to him or her because of this ordinance. So you've lost $10,000, right? Haven't you not? Haven't you? And so see, a white right, the right of disposing of your property as best you see fit, that's a white right. You've lost it. So the Supreme Court said that's illegal. All right. Well, if you just follow that reasoning, there's no doubt that sundown ordinances, which town after town was passing in the north, uh, and they're one-sided, they didn't have any two sides about them, would have been found illegal. But they were never enforced. This decision was never enforced. And even worse, the federal government completely ignored this decision by the United States Supreme Court. So we find that during the uh, FDR administration, Seven, at least, different towns were invented by the federal government, including Greenbelt, Maryland, not far from here, and all of them were invented as sundown towns. Blacks were not allowed after dark. Uh, there's three different greens. There's a Greenbelt-type town outside Cincinnati and another one outside Milwaukee. Uh, there's Boulder, Nevada, which was invented for people who built uh, Hoover Dam. Black folks helped build Hoover Dam, but they had to commute. The Boulder was a sundown town. Uh, Richland... I think it's Richland, uh, Washington, the town that built the, one of the two atom bombs. Uh, that was a sundown town invented by the federal government. And then the FHA chimes in during the Depression and until 1968, really. And the FHA made a policy of never loaning to an interracial neighborhood or an interracial community. Uh, and in fact, in the book, there's actually a photo of this. It's hard to make policies visible. But in Detroit, in northwest Detroit, you can see this on the ground. There's an amazing wall in the pictures in the book that was put up in maybe 1950 or so, a developer in northwest De Detroit wanted to get FHA uh, guarantees for the home loan so that he could sell, make and sell houses, but it was an interracial neighborhood. But all the black folks in this interracial neighborhood lived toward the east. The, the eastern part was interracial, the western part of the neighborhood, it was really one neighborhood, was all white. FHA wouldn't touch it. So he put up this wall that goes from 8 Mile, the famous northern boundary of Detroit, you've maybe seen the movie 8 Mile, which has some actual accurate race relations in it, it's a fine work of sociology. Um, this wall goes from 8 Mile down to a big park. It doesn't go across the streets, but it goes block to block to block. It's about this high, made out of concrete blocks, faced with concrete. It still stands. Neighborhood kids have put graffiti on it and made little murals on it. Black folks now live on both sides of it. But see, this segregated the neighborhood so that the, the western half of it was all white. Now the FHA would loan to the western half. So yeah, the FHA was a big part of the problem. The federal government was a big part of the problem, a huge part of the problem, and it makes a huge difference because suburbia, see, suburb, 80% at least of all suburbs in America were built as sundown towns with the support of the federal government. And that was largely after World War II. And it, one of the differences it makes right now, some of you maybe read about the wealth gap. You know, black folks make about 70% as much income as white folks. Maybe even a higher percentage of that if you do a couple of qualifications for education and marital status. But there's a huge wealth gap. It's about 1 to 11. That is, the amount of wealth that the typical black family has is 1 11th as much as the amount of wealth that a typical white family has. Where is the bulk of any family's wealth? Their home equity. Okay, over the generations. When did it especially happen? After World War II, when we, and I speak racially here, we got support for building our and buying our home in suburbia. Levittown, all of the Levittowns were sundown towns. 
most, most of the development by Levitt & Company, which built 8% of suburbia all by itself, most of that development kept out Jews as well, even though Levitt was Jewish. Uh, better business. Uh, all of these communities then, you, you got a house for maybe $10,000 that is now worth $200,000, and that's where much of our equity, our equity, and I again speak racially, comes from. Okay? And blacks were just flatly shut out of that. So it's a, a problem to the present. No more questions? Come on, you people. Here's one. This is less of a question as saying when people wonder, well, what can we do about it? It's my understanding that the Urban League has, a couple of decades after I had moved into um, Shepherd Park, across on the other side of the park, which itself is a racial barrier, uh, Rock Creek, um, the uh, they take a, you know a couple who other than being African American versus uh, white uh, have the exact same uh, credentials and everything and it's you know and then they'll go out yeah it's called and, testing uh -huh. yeah and um, I they're still do, I think they're still doing it and if anybody wants to help across the nation not just here in the Washington area talking to somebody in the urban league and getting the more local getting local chapters to um, do, do some that. of this stuff yep. might get a fire set um, not literally um, um, you know to to do away with it good point thanks for that point okay we're just going to take two more questions the two that are standing up already yes sir hi um, I'm a teacher in the area and read uh, both of your books already um, enjoy them I wanted to know what advice you could give me as a teacher in terms of having students uh, do the critical research that is necessary so that they don't buy at face value some of the things and things they question in textbooks and in in other things that they're being taught sure. uh, whether it be math history English I think they need to be taught the skill to question and I want to know how sure. they should further uh, develop their own skills sure. as a researcher so I sure. can do it for them. As well. Let me give you just two ideas. The first one will be in general and the second one will be about sundown towns. Uh, the idea in general, uh, especially in um, history or social studies, have more than one textbook in the room so that the idea can't be to learn the right answer that's in the textbook. Because, of course, textbooks don't teach the right answer. Some of them, in fact, teach systematically the wrong answer, as I found out in Lies My Teacher Told Me. But as soon as you have different books in the room, a phenomenon occurs. Uh, there's a teacher right in, in Washington, D.C., who does this. She has a uh, plastic rectangular bushel basket full of old textbooks in the corner of her room. She teaches 11th grade uh, U.S. history. And these are old textbooks. She has them from 1924 to the present. And they're cheap. I mean, it's not an expensive thing to do. Many uh, used bookstores won't even handle them because nobody wants old textbooks. When you find one that does sell them, they're 50 cents, so it's no great investment. Uh, she's got about 30 of them over there in the, in the box. And when things go, get slow, she says, she says to the students, or sometimes she does it on purpose, she does it for President Hoover, for instance, okay, everybody, go get a book. And so they all go, and they, they know this means go get a book from the, from the bushel basket over there. So they all get their book. Uh, some of them get the same book every time, others just get whatever book they get. And they learn about Hoover. And darn if they don't learn that, one of them learns maybe, that President Hoover was very concerned about people's rights. He cared, cared about the Depression. He had been in charge of relief in Europe after World War I, after all. He had been in charge of relief in uh, Mississippi and Louisiana after the devastating 1927 flood, um, kind of the precursor of our Katrina disaster. Uh, so he cared about poor people. He didn't know what to do about the Depression, but, he ca but another person from their textbook learns that President Hoover was a millionaire, a self-made millionaire. He thought anybody could become wealthy in America if they just uh, were, were good enough and that poor people didn't try hard enough. And another person learns that he did care, but he was hamstrung by his Republican small government ideology, whereas another person, and you suddenly realize it makes no sense to learn what the textbook says, because her textbook says something different from his textbook says something different from that one. So then you have to think, you know. That's one idea. And the other idea about sundown towns. Students, even middle school students, and certainly high school students, can do research on the racial history of their community, especially if it was a sundown town. And some of them have across the country 
having gotten the idea from me, from my speaking, and now hopefully they'll get it from the book. Uh, they can go interview old folks, for instance. Uh, middle school students are really good at this. They can go to the nursing home, get their tape recorder on, have wonderful conversations with 80-year-olds who often know a lot better about the 1930s than they do about what happened last week. As a matter of fact, I know more about the 1930s <laughs> increasingly than I do what happened last week. Um, and so they can, they can help out these communities by doing good research on them and really proving. And some towns are no longer sundown towns. And that's a great story, too. We need to learn how did that happen. How did Oak Park desegregate? How did Valparaiso, Indiana, which was famous for being an all-white community with Valparaiso University and so on, and in that case, actually, two black families from Chicago were recruited in and brought in, and the, the uh, white professors and students from the university who brought them in had to maintain a 24-hour guard on the house because people threatened them and so on, but it worked, and Valparaiso is now over it. You know, These are wonderful stories worth telling, and students can be involved in the telling. Okay? Last question. It better be good. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Well, it's obvious that race relations in this country is still unfinished business. Your book makes the case quite well. Hurricane Katrina showed that to us. So my question to you is, um, uh, given what you were saying about uh, black families being driven out of town and not knowing if they were compensated for their homes, and also the, the knowing disparity between the, the family's wealth and uh, this racial policy about housing. Um, did the issue of reparations come up for you while you were doing your research? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I think that the idea of reparations for our sundown town policies and for the entire policies we did during the Nader, let's say from 1890 to 1968, because that's when the federal government switched sides, um, and there's some communities that have yet to switch sides. Um, I think the, the idea of reparations is, is definitely involved. Uh, and we've actually paid it once. And that is for the sundown town of Rosewood, Florida. Now, Rosewood rather famously drove out its black population in, what, 1922? I'm a sociologist. We just try to get it appro approximate, you know. I'm within two years, I think. Um, and the state of Florida, about four or five years ago, paid reparations for that. Now, any such expulsion, like the expulsion from Vienna, Illinois in 1954, is a breakdown of law and order. It's a breakdown of the government, among other things, because the government uh, is required, one of its primary purposes, to make us secure in our own homes, you know, to make us in a secure, peaceful community. And usually, of course, we find in such a situation that the government is overtly on the opposite side, but at the very least, it fails to provide security in the home, security in the... So the government is part of the liability network, as well as the specific white people who did the, the uh, driving out. And that's what Florida stepped up to the plate and dealt with. Now, Tulsa failed to deal with it about a year or two ago and may yet deal with it. Uh, we hope it will. Um, there, there's a movement in Tulsa to pay reparations and in Oklahoma. But so far, it has not passed the legislature. Uh, it should. Um, there has been no movement in any of the other sundown towns that I know of. I have to say this. This last summer, an African-American who is the descendant of a family in Pierce City, Missouri, found out about how his family and how the entire black community was expelled from Pierce City, and this past summer got his great-grandfather's remains exhumed from the Pierce City Cemetery and reburied in Springfield, Missouri, where, because, of course, there's nobody to keep up the grave or visit the grave or anything else in Pierce City. The, the family cemetery plot is in Springfield, it having left there uh, over a century ago. And he got Pierce City to officially apologize for the expulsion. Uh, but I don't even know of any other, I don't think I know, I might know of one other, but it doesn't come to mind right now, of the, of the thousands of sundown towns, I don't think any of them have even apologized. I think at the very least, we should expect sundown towns to do three things. State they did it. Admit it. We did this. That's a problem already, to get them to do that. Number two, apologize. We did it, and it was wrong. And number three, Admit, and not only admit, but state openly, we don't do it anymore. We welcome everybody. After all, George Wallace did those three things before he died. Can't we get Chevy Chase to do that? Can't we get University Park, et cetera, to do that? I think, I think we should. And then the question of reparations is perfectly reasonable. Uh, 
especially I think about like Vienna, Illinois. There's plenty of people alive today, I mean at least several, this having happened in 1954, who were personally driven out of Vienna. You know, what about them? Okay, I think you've got a good point there. Well, come up and ask me more stuff. I'll be up here signing books. Oh, I will show you my map if you wish. This is my beaten up road atlas. Um, I will show you the entire county in Maryland, for instance, that was a sundown, that may still be a sundown county, but certainly it was a sundown county until at least 1980. Uh, I'll show you my map of, oh, I don't know what state you want to see, let's say Illinois. Um, everything pink is a sundown town probably, okay, plus there's another map for the Chicago suburbs.